Welcome. This is Concept One Notes of our genetics unit, and we are going to talk about DNA's structure and also the process of DNA replication. So just a refresher, hopefully you remember nucleic acids from Unit 1, Concept 3. We learned about macromolecules. The nucleic acids are one of our four macromolecules that we can't live without, and they hold our genetic material also referred to as DNA. Nucleic acids have genes. These are set, genes are just sections of your DNA that serve as the blueprint or the instruction manual for making proteins. Genes are located at certain points on a chromosome. And remember, proteins carry out all of our cellular activity. Proteins basically run your show. So this is really imp important that our DNA contains the instructions for making them because then the proteins are going to do so much for us. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. And so both are really important and we'll talk about both um, in this concept. So if you remember, the monomer of nucleic acids are nucleotides and nucleotides are just what makes them up. And a nucleotide has three parts. It's made of a sugar, um, which is deoxyribose and DNA and ribose and RNA. That's the sugar in blue. Has a phosphate group, which is right here pictured in red. And then it has a nitrogenous base, or some would just refer to it as a nitrogen base. And this is different. This is what makes each nucleotide unique. Um, it could be adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, which is only in DNA, and uracil, which is only in RNA. So you'll see A, G, C, and U in RNA and A, G, C, and T in DNA. But, and then the sugars are also different whether it's DNA or RNA. And so this is really important. And you notice I just I abbreviated these nitrogen bases by the first letter and that'll happen a lot as we move through this unit. So first let's talk through the structure of DNA. This was not discovered overnight. It was a long process and there were a lot of key people that contributed to it. But what we eventually came to is that DNA is a double helix. It's like a twisted ladder. Double because that's two strands and twisted um, and helix because it's twisted. Sugars and phosphate form a sugar phosphate backbone. So if, if you were to unwind this DNA and kind of lay it flat like this ladder, it, there's alternating sugars and phosphates on the outside. And then nitrogen bases bond in the middle with weak hydrogen bonds, and that's kind of what forms the rungs of the ladder that you would climb. All other bonds in it are strong covalent bonds. Now, when we're looking at those middle rungs of the ladder, those nitrogen bases, they pair up with their complementary base pair. And again, we said these are held together by weak hydrogen bonds. A's always bond with T's in DNA, and C's always bond with G's. That's really important. And again, these are referred to as the complementary base pairing rules. Um, if you're from the South and you like football, we always remember these with my students as Auburn Tigers and Carolina Gamecocks. But you may want to think of another way to remember these that might be easier for you if you're not from um, the Southeast in the United States and or don't care about football. Okay. RNA structure, it's a little different. Just look at it. It's a single strand of nucleotides with exposed bases. And these RNA bases will bind with DNA bases. And we'll see that as we go through some important processes in this unit. But in this case, A's are going to bind with U's. Because remember we said two slides ago that DNA has thymine. It does not have uracil. And RNA has uracil and doesn't have thymine. C's still bond with G's. So if you're using our little um, football example, it still works. It's just Auburn University and Carolina Gamecocks. So that's how we remember those in my class. Okay, so a little summary chart just to show their differences and compare them. The nitrogen bases that make up DNA are A, T, C, and G. And the nitrogen bases that make up RNA are A, U, C, and G. The sugar that makes up DNA is what we call DNA. It's deoxyribonucleic acid. And then RNA is just ribonucleic acid for ribose. And then DNA is, again, we would simply describe its shape as a double helix, whereas RNA we would describe as just a single strand. Now, 
the basics of heredity, these are some words that um, we've talked through before when we were talking about our mitosis unit, but I just want to review them with you because it's really important that you know the difference between DNA and chromosomes and genes because they're often used interchangeably and that's not necessarily always correct. So your DNA is really long and so what will happen is it will um, tightly coil itself up into chromosomes and different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. So for example, humans have, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in our body cells, so 46 total. We say 23 pairs because 23 um, come from your mom and her egg, and 23 come from your biological father and his sperm, and that's where the 46 come from. Dogs have 37 pairs, um, 74 total in their body cells. Fruit flies um, have six total. So it just all, the number just depends on the organism. Now, genes. A gene is a section of DNA that has the instructions to code for a protein. One chromosome can have thousands of genes on it. That's really important. So if I was going to summarize these three words into one or two sentences, I would say genes are pieces or sections of DNA. Chromosomes are long strands of DNA all bunched up. And this picture kind of um, shows us that. So you can see, I like it here. It shows our A's and our T's and our C's and our G's on our DNA. It shows the DNA getting coiled up tightly. Um, it tightens, it wraps around these histones and creates these nucleosomes, and that's what creates the chromosome structure. And then you can see the chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell here. So I kind of like how this is organized. The only thing I don't love about this picture is if you remember from our mitosis, when we learned about mitosis, when a chromosome looks like an X like this, those are sister chromatids. Those are duplicated chromosomes. So this would be after S phase of interphase, right before the cell divides, where I have two copies of each chromosome. So that's the only thing I don't necessarily love about this, but I do like that it kind of shows how the DNA bunches into chromosomes, and then also just like a section of this, just a, a little piece of it would be considered a gene. Okay, now that we've done a little basic overview of the structure of DNA and RNA, we're going to talk about a critical process known as DNA replication. We have two other really important processes we'll talk about in concept two, but for now we're going to talk about replication. So, when your cell is ready to divide, whether it's going to do mitosis, like we already learned about, or meiosis, which we'll learn about in concept three, it's first going to copy its DNA. It's going to double it. And the process of making an identical copy of DNA is called DNA replication. So it's DNA making more DNA. This is happening in the nucleus because that's where your DNA is located. And this is happening during S phase, the synthesis phase of interphase. So if you remember that, we learned that we said that your DNA is doubling. Well, we're going to learn what that act process actually is. What does that DNA doubling look like? And this is a critical process because it ensures that every new cell that's made from cell division will have the same DNA as the original cell. And that's really important. Think about humans. I told you that your body cells have 46 chromosomes in them. So after DNA replication, I have two copies of all 46 chromosomes, which would be 92 individual chromatids. But then when the cell divides in half, each cell ends up with 46, exactly like the parent cell. If this process didn't happen and we just had it never doubled and then 46 chromosomes in one cell divided into two cells, the resulting two daughter cells would have half the amount of DNA. They would only have 23 chromosomes and they wouldn't be able to make all the proteins they need to make. So it's really important that that DNA doubles. Okay, so let's talk about what the actual process is. I'm going to summarize it into three basic steps. First, the DNA gets unzipped, and all of this is happening by a bunch of different enzymes. Then those enzymes, um, well, some different ones, but they help find the complementary bases and bind them according to the base pairing rules. So they find the A's and they bring T's to them. To the T's, they bring A's, and then they get the C's and G's together. So you can see this yellow showing the original strand on here, and the green's the original strand here, and then we're adding new strands. In the end, it's going to keep going until we get to two identical DNA molecules being formed, each that has an old strand, which means like an original strand, and a new strand. 
And that's why we call this semi-conservative replication, because part of the original DNA is conserved and passed on into the new DNA. So for example, let's say this is your DNA unwound. Each parent strand, so it's going to unzip, so I got the two blue parent strands, they're going to serve as a template, and then the new bases come in in red. So the new bases are the complements to the original strand. So at the end, your DNA is identical, and it's half old and half new. That's why DNA is considered semi-conservative. Now that's about as simple as I can make it because it's a lot more complicated of a process. But this is super important you understand it because we have to consider what kinds of mistakes could occur during this process and what would be the implications of those kinds of mistakes if they were to happen. Consider, so you know, what would be a difference if this happened to the DNA of a body cell, like a brain cell, or if it happened to a mistake happened in the DNA replication process in a sex cell being made like a sperm cell. That's super important to consider, and we'll talk about it as a class. Oh, and what would be different if it happened in just one gene versus an entire chromosome? That's something I want you to think about too, and then we'll discuss them. And that's your very basic overview of DNA structure and replication.